So um, if you if you decide to um, continue studying AI in the future, uh, something that you might realize is that it's really easy for AI to become biased against uh, marginalized communities. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're we're doing everything that we can in order to make sure that the technology we're building is doing something good for the world. And lastly, our third value is diversity and inclusion. We want to make sure that everyone has access to an AI education, no matter what background you're from. Um, as I mentioned earlier, AI can often easily have uh, bad impacts on a lot of marginalized communities. And we want to make sure that um, especially people from those communities have an access to AI education and are able to have a say in how the technology that affects them is going to be built. Um, and we have a variety of different uh, of initiatives that try to directly address this diversity problem in AI, uh, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, so ACM AI has four uh, major initiatives that we work on. First is workshops. You're at one of our workshops initiatives right now. These are recurring quarter long workshops that teach fundamental AI skills to UCLA students just like you. Additionally, we also put on a variety of different one off events. Um, catered for UCLA students to increase their awareness of AI. We've had a lot of uh, interesting events in the past, such as a um, AI and social impact panel, where we invited a lot of guests who are working at the intersection of AI and social impact to come talk about their experience. Um, last quarter, we also hosted a AI research panel, where we hosted a bunch of professors who were doing, who were doing really interesting AI research here at UCLA, had them come talk to students just like yourself about how you can get involved in AI research as an undergraduate. We also have a variety of outreach initiatives that aim to increase awareness of AI outside of UCLA. Uh, some of the initiatives that our outreach team works on are teaching a um, high school introductory uh, AI course at a local high school, um, as well as hosting the You Belong in AI podcast, which hosts uh, a variety of different uh, leaders uh, in AI uh, in discussions about the importance of diversity and inclusion in the field. And lastly, we have our projects initiative, which um, gives UCLA students the opportunity to apply the uh, skills in AI that you learn at our beginner and advanced track workshops uh, towards real world problems and get some experience working on teams um, and applying your ML skills. Um, and Harsh will talk about these uh, in a bit. Cool. So big thank you to John for the for the introduction there. So what's up, guys? My name is Harsh Shabisa. I'm the projects director at ACMAI. And I just wanted to come on and talk a little bit about projects and, you know, what our specific project is this quarter and how you can get involved in projects and maybe join in the future. So this quarter, we're working on an important problem called Kosova Net. So essentially, we're trying to build an automated system for detecting what kind of disease a Kosova leaf has. So a little bit of background on what a Kosova leaf is. It's a very important food source in Africa. It's probably like one of the most important uh, like backbones of food stability in Africa. But lately they've found that a lot of the recent Kosova crops have had different kinds of diseases, uh, which you know renders them inviolable. So people have been trying to make a machine learning model that can take a picture of a Kosova leaf and determine whether or not it has a disease. And if it does, what kind of disease it has. And that's the, that's the project we're gonna be working on this quarter. And you know, these are the types of projects we wanna work on uh, you know, in ACMAI that you know, are challenging, are interesting, but um, you know, are also at a level where we feel that people with, uh, you know, even if they don't have a ton of experience, if they take our beginner track and our advanced track courses, should have enough knowledge to contribute to a project. So that's our goal in ACMAI projects, to create an environment where somebody with maybe not a ton of experience can come on and have that first experience, uh, you know, building an end-to-end -end machine learning project. So, uh, you know, if you want to get involved um, in ACM AI projects, we're making it a hard requirement for anybody that wants to join to take the advanced track course uh, that ACM AI workshops offers. So I know all you guys are in the beginner track right now. So, you know, one possible, you know, route for you to join projects is to take beginner track right now and then maybe take advanced track in the spring and then, uh, you know, join uh, the projects team during the fall. So, yeah, that's a little bit about us. If you have any more questions, feel free to, you know, either DM me on Facebook or preferably DM me on the Discord. And uh, looking forward to hopefully uh, working with some of you guys uh, on the projects team in the future. Thanks, guys.
All right, thank you, Harsh and John, for the introductions of projects and ACM. Now we'll talk a bit more about what we'll be teaching in beginner track and what you guys can expect to get out of this course. Um, we'll get started by introducing the officers that are teaching this course. Like I said, my name is Vaishnavi Tabredi. I'm the workshops director at ACMAI. And we also have two other very talented and enthusiastic officers teaching the course with us this quarter. And that'll be Ben and Nikhil. Hi, uh, my name is Ben. I'm a fourth year and I will, I'm also an officer in ACMAI. So I'll be teaching beginner track uh, this quarter. Yeah, and I'm Nikhil, I'm a first year CS major and I am an ACMAI intern this quarter. Okay, awesome. So uh, beginner track, as the name suggests, is for members that have absolutely no experience with machine learning. Um, and if you do have some experience programming or have taken a CS class at UCLA or somewhere else before, that's great. That'll be a great um, skill for you to have. But even if you don't have any programming experience or CS experience, that's totally fine as well. In fact, towards the end of this workshop, we're going to do a brief introduction to Python. Um, which hopefully can like help you gauge where you're at and give you some new tools with machine learning. So if you want to build a solid foundation in the theory behind machine learning, this track is perfect for you. We do focus a lot on theory, but um, in the next slide, we're going to talk about exactly what we'll be covering in each week. And you'll see that towards the end, we also have some practical applications that you can work on where you'll be um, working on implementing some of the models and the theory that we talk about. So as I was saying earlier, um, we covered the very basics of machine learning. This is meant for someone that doesn't know what AI is or hasn't heard much about machine learning. Um, we'll also be introducing some useful ML libraries. If you don't know what a library is, that's also totally fine. We'll be talking about all of this later. Our meetings will be at the same time every week, week two right now till week nine. Um, all our events are posted on the Facebook event page. So if you ever forget, you can find us on Facebook and we'll be posting the Zoom link on there every week. Before we move on, I have a quick poll just to gauge um, where everyone is at with their machine learning experience. Give me one sec, let me launch it. The poll is completely anonymous. We just wanna see where the members are at. Okay, awesome. Um, looks like most of you don't have much ML experience, which is very exciting for us because I hope that by the end of this track, you're pretty confident with what machine learning is and can hopefully apply the skills you've learned here and some cool projects later on as well. Okay, so the three tracks that we're offering this quarter are beginner track, advanced track, and advanced plus plus. Harsh talked a little bit about advanced track and how it's a great segue to our projects subcommittee within ACMAI. So as I've said, beginner track is for um, members like you who don't necessarily have that much experience with machine learning, but do want to learn a lot more. And advanced track picks up right where we leave off with this track, where we go into more advanced machine learning topics. We talk about neural networks, if you've heard of that. Um, and yeah, just build on what we introduce in beginner track and delve deeper into more cool AI algorithms. And then advanced plus plus is kind of a continu continuation of advanced track, except that each week is a workshop of its own. So um, we explore a new topic every week and these topics are often influenced by what members wanna see. And we're offering that this quarter as well. So even if, um, I know that a lot of you guys on the poll said that you're very new to machine learning, even if that's the case with you, some of our advanced plus plus workshops require no prior experience. For example, we have a workshop on fair amount that we're likely offering two weeks from now. So if you want to check, if you want to check out that workshop, please do. We'll be marketing it more later on and we'll be talking about it more in our next week's workshop. But um, yeah, definitely be on the lookout for what each of these tracks is teaching, because I think some of them you can benefit from right now as well. And we'll also be offering these tracks multiple times throughout the quarter. So if you attend beginner track now, you will have chances to attend advanced track and advanced plus plus later on. 
AI also hosts office hours. It's a combined office hours for all the different tracks we're teaching, or if you're involved with any of our other initiatives. Um, our office hours are every Thursday, 9 p.m. on the ACM Discord. Um, here's the link right now. If you're not on the Discord already, please do join. Um, you can also see what all the other committees are up to on there. So it's definitely a great place to communicate within ACM. At, not just during our office hours, at any point, if you have questions on what we covered during the tracks, questions about ACM, AI in general, questions about um, how you can get more involved, feel free to DM us on there, or you can ask us in the chat during workshops. Our first office hours will be this Thursday. We will be having office hours this week. Okay, here's the beginner track scheduled I mentioned earlier. Today we'll just be going into an introduction of what machine learning is and then delving into an introduction to Python. Um, if we are not able to finish that this week, we'll continue on with that next week and discuss this ML algorithm called K nearest neighbors. Um, and then the next couple of weeks, we'll just be building on different ML models. Um, so when we learn linear regression workshop three, which will be week four, logistic regression will be covered the week after. And all of these, all of these workshops are mostly going to be theory, but like I said, we do have a more practical component to this workshop that will take place the last two weeks. So workshops seven and workshops eight, which will take place weeks eight and nine. Um, it'll just be mostly you guys implementing your own ML algorithms. You'll be implementing linear regression and logistic regression and applying it to this objective, such as like classifying a data set. And we'll just be there guiding you guys and making sure that you're on a good track. So hopefully after all these workshops, you'll be in good shape to do that. And if I threw out any terms or if John or Harsh so far threw out any terms that you are unfamiliar with or um, have never heard of before, that's totally fine. This workshop is, like I said many times prior, it's for complete beginners and machine learning can be daunting if you're just starting out. But as AI officers, our main objective is that you're getting the most out of these workshops. So feel free to approach us if we are, if you ever feel like we're going too fast or going too slow, and we'll try to make this um, workshop as interactive and as beneficial for you as possible. Okay, so before we get into what machine learning is, let's discuss a couple of cool applications. In the chat, could you guys say um, just some fields that you've seen AI and ML being applied? There's some great answers in the chat so far. Yes, AI is a very useful tool during COVID, um, both with like tracking um, how fast and where COVID is spreading and also for coming up with a vaccine for COVID. Video games, airport security, Netflix recommendations. Yeah, these are all really great answers. Um, and I'm hoping that after you go through our tracks, you can kind of get a better idea too of how ML is being applied in these areas. So something that I don't think anyone mentioned in the chat yet is computer vision, which is essentially how, um, well, like the name suggests, it's computer vision, how a machine could see, which is very different from how a human would see. If you think about self-driving cars, which we hear a lot about in the news lately, um, there's infinite combinations of scenes that a car can encounter, right? So how do you, how do you tell a car what the scene in front of it is. How do you tell it that um, there's a pedestrian in front of you? Or um, yes, there's a green light, but there's someone running across the road, so you probably shouldn't go. Or just like things like that. There's an infinite combination of possibilities. So how can a computer see and interpret the scene in front of it like a human being can so easily and efficiently do? Um, and in this field, there's been huge advancements in recent years, and there's so many articles you can read online about it as well. Um, Convolutional neural networks are um, is an AI model that's very popularly used for computer vision. And that's something that you actually learn the theory behind and implement in our advanced track workshop. If you continue with beginner track and go into advanced track next quarter, you will be learning about that. So that's a really cool application. Um, healthcare is also where we're seeing a lot of applications of AI. Um, there's also like so many combinations of symptoms um, that a doctor could be saying, let's say, 
So having AI, having this model that is really good and is really good and really well versed in like different possible combinations of what the problem could be is a great aid for doctors or just people in the healthcare field because AI has done great work so far in helping diagnose diseases and just like identifying symptoms. And natural language processing. I think this is another answer that no one has said in the chat yet, but it's again, a very, very cool application of AI. If you click on this link right here, it'll take you to an article that talks about this college student. So someone around your age that used this AI model released by OpenAI, um, which is an AI company. And he was able to build, he was able to build a model that generated a blog post that most people couldn't identify as a fake blog post. Like no human has written it. A computer just generated a blog post and it gained a lot of pop, pop, popularity and people didn't even realize that it was AI and it was taken down later. But you know, that's so cool to think that a machine can come up with a blog post article that most human eyes can identify as being something that was written by a machine and not by a human. So the purpose of discussing all these applications is just to say that AI is a very cool, current and relevant field. And as you're going through our workshops and as you go through the different tracks, hopefully you can, um, you can envision how you can contribute to that field or you'll find something that's really interesting that you wanna work more on. And if anything, you'll at least be familiar with the field and it won't be as intimidating. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Ben who'll finally talk about what machine learning is. We've talked about so much other stuff till this point, but yeah, we'll get into it starting now. All right. And before we talk about what machine learning is, we're gonna start with an example. <laughs> we're actually a little game that we're gonna play. Um, let's first get this, get my screen shared so that I have control. Okay, um, right. So we're gonna play a little game and the purpose of this game is to kind of demonstrate um, kind of how machine learning works on Kind of, it's sort of an analogy for how machine learning works. It's not exactly how it works, but uh, hopefully this will give you guys a bit of an intuition. So let's move on. The game is called 5050. And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use the poll feature on Zoom. And the objective of the game is to find the letter of the alphabet where 50% of you guys' first names come before this uh, letter and then 50% of the first names come after this letter. Um, and we're gonna do it sort of iteratively. So what that means is we're gonna start off by choosing a random letter, okay. and then uh, you're gonna have a poll that has three options, why, either before the current letter, after the current letter, or at the current letter. So for example, if I chose the letter um, L, my first name is Ben. So I would say, I would pick the, the, the answer before the current letter. Um, and if my name was um, like Vaishnavi, it would be after L. So I would click after at, after the current letter. And then you would vote for one of these options and then we're gonna interpret the results. So let me get the poll started. Oh yeah, wait, first off, we're gonna choose a letter. Um, what do you guys think is a good first letter to start with? Let me first get the chat open. L, K, M, M. All right, sounds like M is a good letter that we wanna start with. And now let's launch the poem. So just as a reminder, if your name is like mine, it would be before M, so you'd say before. If it's after, then you say after. And if it starts with an M, then you'd say current letter. We have four more people, three more. And One more person. All right, I'm gonna give you five seconds. Four. All right, I'm gonna just end the poll here. Um, and let me share the results. So here are the results. There are 53% of your, this is actually pretty close. 53% uh, of uh, the audience picked before the current letter, 37 picked after the current letter and 11% picked at the current letter. So we're actually pretty close to 50-50 already. Um, so now, what do you guys think we should choose as the next letter? And from these results, how do we interpret them? What does it tell, what do these results tell us about our choice? 
So actually, K or L? L? Right. So it sounds like a lot of people are choosing letters that are after M, right? And why do you think that we're choosing a letter after M? Does anyone want to give an answer? Speak up. <laughs> then you're in the world. Was it? You meant before M, right? Before M. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I know the alphabet. <laughs> no, now we believe that you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's just to um, like even the distribution because it was close to 50 50, but mm -hmm. slightly more had it before. Exactly. That's exactly right. And later on, when we look at uh, linear and logistic regression, we're going to see that the algorithm we use to sort of optimize or to, to do machine learning does something similar to this, where we kind of figure out how far off we are from the right answer. And we adjust our prediction or our model, in this case, which letter we're picking to split 50-50 to kind of be closer to the correct answer. And so if we try picking L um, this time, we can see how many people are before and after this current letter. I don't know, how, I, did, I did it in my head, MLM somehow. <laughs> so embarrassing. Maybe it's because you're all talking about ML and like it's like M after, or L after M, so. There you go, that's why. <laughs> That's my excuse. That's definitely why. <laughs> oh, I think we're almost there. Unless that the 19th person doesn't vote. Okay, five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Oh, oh no, the last person voted and now it's not 50-50. <laughs> so close. Um, I think we might, wait, <laughs> this is probably as close as we're going to get because we have an odd number um, and LM. Um, but you see, we kind of got a little bit of a better answer. Actually, I don't think this is much better answer because it was so close already. <laughs> L.5, exactly. Um, but the idea is there. Um, and hopefully this game gave you guys a little bit of an intuition for how later on in the future workshops, we're going to be doing machine learning. All right, let's move on. So what is ML? We finally get to this slide. Um, on the right here, we have a little XKCD comic talking about ML. And it asks, like, this is your machine learning system. You pour data into a pile of linear algebra and you get answers on the other side. And if they're wrong, you just keep stirring them until they start looking right. It's a joke, but um, that's sort of, I mean, we're going to do some very informed uh, stirring of the pile to get the right answers. But we will be using some linear algebra. Don't worry if you don't have, if you're not very confident in it. Um, we're going to ease into it and explain everything thoroughly. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, none of this is magic and it's just math underneath it all. And hopefully by the end of these workshops, you're going, you guys are going to have a better understanding of the math so that, you know, we kind of demystify AI. First off, uh, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about um, the differences between AI, ML, and deep learning. We kind of throw these terms around or you hear it thrown around a lot in the news or in articles that you read but there is a difference between them. And this diagram here kind of shows you the difference. AI is sort of the broad term that encompasses a lot of different algorithms. Machine learning is a subset of AI and deep learning is an even smaller subset of machine learning. If we wanna go a little bit more specific, we have some definitions here. Artificial intelligence is a concept where the theory and development of computer systems are able to perform tasks that, are normally, that normally require human intelligence. And some examples of that are things like we, uh, Vaishnavi we showed you earlier, visual perception, which is computer vision, decision-making and translation between languages. Um, artificial intelligence doesn't just, here in like ACM AI and especially the workshops that we teach, we focus mainly on machine learning, but some people might consider other algorithms like decision trees where you just have, um, where you just make decisions like, okay, is it raining or is it not? And if it is raining, um, then, you know, you check 
is a person at home or at work or right? then you, you basically have a is it that you have a, a tree it's a decision tree so um you make you can make discrete decisions based off of um like information that you have but it's not the machine learning that we're going to be focusing on uh in these workshops and the other type of the other definition is machine learning which is uh, and as the previous slide said, is a type of AI. Um, and the type of AI that um, provides computers with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And this will be clearer in later workshops when we actually start going into the details with linear, in the de de into the details of linear and logistic regression. But for now, the idea is basically that with normal programming, right, we kind of explicitly tell the computer what to do. With machine learning, we kind of provide it with information and it learns from that information how to kind of solve the problem we want it to solve. And this is sort of the pipeline that we're gonna to use to um, do machine learning. Where again, we start off with some form of data. Um, this can be like in the form of a text file or a spreadsheet where you can have each, for example, each row can be something like the conditions for the day and then whether or not that day was raining. And then the model can learn from that data um, a, a formula or a function that kind of represents, okay, if we have this information about the day, maybe the amount of the humidity, the temperature, the amount of cloud cover, we can use that to kind of predict whether or not it's going to rain that day. And using that data, we can train a model. And finally, once we have a trained model, we can use that model to do inference, or in other words, we want to apply that model to real world data and not just the data that we've collected so far. So like if we just have information about the current day that there's a certain amount of cloud cover um, and there's a certain temperature, we can predict whether or not it's going to rain today, even though you know it hasn't rained or not. This is the pipeline in a little bit more detail and I don't want to scare you guys because uh, we're only going to be focusing on the training and application process. So the yellow and green boxes here. But there's also a little bit more to machine learning than that because the data that we have usually isn't that clean. So we have to do some scaling, removing outliers, and some pre-processing um, to the data before we can actually use it to train our models. Um, and then after we train our models, we also have to evaluate it. And that's another step in the process where we need to see, okay, we've trained the models on um, a certain data set. Now we need to see, okay, if we, if we use this model on data it hasn't seen before, it hasn't trained on, how well does it actually perform? And using that, we can kind of predict, you know, how well our, will our model perform in real life? And that's the green box here where we do inference. Right, so I give you a little bit of an example where we talk, uh, where we kind of predict the amount of rainfall based off of like the current day's conditions. But now I want you guys to kind of think about another example where let's say you were asked to estimate what a house's price was. What do you think are some possible inputs for this model? Like what do you think would be useful for predicting what the price of a house was? And you can answer it in chat or you can unmute and give an answer. Yeah. Like I never said, please unmute, turn on your camera. It is recorded, so I understand if you aren't comfortable, but it's nice. So some people are saying size, area. Um, and then you could have like number of bedrooms and bathrooms and things like that. Yes, exactly. Which That's might be that. correlated with like the, the size, but could still be a parameter. Exactly, right. Um, definitely the no number of bedrooms um, and the number of and just different features of the house like that. Some other people have mentioned um, zip code, that's right. Location, which is related to zip code, just like, uh, you, just like you said, uh, the number of bedrooms or bathrooms might be related to the size of the house. Uh, when it was built, yeah. And so basically the idea is there's a lot of different um, features or that's what we call them, our inputs that we can use to kind of predict the house or the price of a house. And, sorry, oh, did my computer just crash? Hello, can you guys still hear me? I have a Um, If you guys can hear me, Vaishnavi, can you take over? Uh, yes, I can. 
Okay, great. I can hear you, but I can't see anything. Hi, sorry about that. Can you guys see the slide? Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Give me one sec. Also, Ben, are you good now? I see that your camera's fine. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I still have a black screen, so no, I can hear you guys, but I can't. <laughs> I don't think I can show the slides. I'm going to restart my computer, and I'll be back later, I guess. That sounds good. So I think where Ben left off was that there was multiple inputs that all of you guys suggested in the chat that were all great answers. Um, so when we're building a machine learning model and the output, our end point or end goal is to figure out what the price of a house would be given certain inputs, such as the size, number of bedrooms, you're built, um, the schools in the area, all the different variables that you guys were suggesting. So now the output of our model, like I said, is a housing price. Would this be something that's continuous or categorical? And categorical, um, a categorical variable would be something that's this or that, like what animal something is, is categorical, whereas the how old you are is continuous. Okay, awesome. Everyone said continuous in the chat. And if for some reason you were thinking categorical, the reason it's continuous is because the housing price is something that's, um, it's not a disjoint output, right? It's, it's a number and it could be any number pretty much. So the point of the earlier exercise was to, um, was to kind of think like a machine learning model. So, or is, is to think in the right direction when you're building a machine learning model, right? Like you have to think about what inputs are available to you, what variables might be useful ones to look at. And um, in the training process that we saw in the pipeline earlier, in this training process right over here, I don't, can you guys see my cursor? Okay, cool. So in this training process right over here, um, instead of explicitly telling a machine learning model, hey, um, the size, the number of bedrooms in your house in a house is really important in figuring out the house price. But perhaps the number of parks in that community aren't isn't as important of a factor in figuring out that house price. So this is something that this isn't information that's necessarily explicitly available to us, right? So how can we figure this out? We can build a machine learning model to do that for us. So um, what you do when you have this machine learning model is, sorry, I'm distracted by the chat. Yeah, well, maybe maybe once we train our model, we'll find out otherwise. And parks are actually really important in figuring out the, um, the price of the house. But that's exactly why training a machine learning model on a lot of data is important, right? So when you're building a machine learning model, what you would do is you'd have a lot of data and then you'd have you'd have a certain model that you decide to train this data on. And what training basically entails is, um, I'll give an example of supervised learning right now. We'll talk about the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning later on. But in supervised learning, what you would do is you would, when you're training your model, you'd say, hey, um, here are a bunch of different parameters. Here are a bunch of different values for um, the size of the house, the number of bedrooms. And then here is the price of what that house was. And then you train your model on a bunch of different of these, uh, of this input data. So over time, your model picks up, okay, I see that in the data you've given me, the, the number of parks are actually really important. The number of bedrooms are really, really important, but the number of bathrooms isn't as important. So in the future, when you have this trained model and you only have the input um, data available in the sense that you only have the number of bedrooms available, you only have the number of parks available, and you, and you wanna find out what the price of that house is, this model that trained on past data can now take this new information that it has never seen before and give a pretty good prediction of what the price of that house is. Does that make sense? Somewhat, we'll go into it more. I see Austin nodding, thank you, it's very reassuring. So um, that's a very general idea of what machine learning works. And looking at it at a higher level, you know, in classical programming, what you do is you have data and then and then you explicitly program a computer on what to do with that data and then you get an output. But in many situations in real life, 
you can't do that. In the um, self-driving car example we were talking about earlier, you can't tell the car, hey, if you see um, this person-like looking creature and they are in front of you, you should probably break, right? Because that doesn't really make sense because there's so many different combinations of that exact image that could show up. So what you do instead is you give you give that model a bunch of data and then you tell it, instead of telling it exactly what to look for when making predictions, you teach it, you teach it and then you train it to learn what to look for. And it figures that out on its own so that you can use this model later when you have new data and then it can give you the outputs that you're looking for. Um, I just spit out a lot of words. Oh, Ben's back. Awesome. Okay. Well, I just spit out a lot of words. Could someone please unmute themselves and give us a high level explanation of how you'd use a machine learning model to predict the housing price? Or feel free to type it in the chat. Um, so maybe you would basically look at kind of the, um, you would look at your like training data and kind of see what parameters have the most impact on um, what the price of a house might be like. And then you include those parameters in your model. Um, and basically just the most important ones so that it's not too like, you know, specific of a model maybe. Um, and then, yeah, then you basically try whatever model you end up with on different houses to see, okay, did it get it somewhat right? Yeah, you mentioned a couple of great things there. Um, I believe you said the word parameters, but um, in general, we're looking at variables, right? Like different, like, um, yeah, but exactly what you said, we're looking at different variables and um, we use these variables to figure out the relationship between those variables and the housing price. And that's what the model does for us. And something else that you mentioned is you don't want it to be too fitting to that training data or essentially the data that you're training the model on. Um, and for this training data, you do have the output, you do have the house price. Later, when you give your model testing data is when you don't have the house price, but the model is now trained and is able to give that value for you. But um, when you're using your training data, you don't want to train it too extensively on that specific data, because later when you give it new information, it may not be able to perform as well. And that entire concept is called overfitting, which we'll learn more about later. So if what I just if what I just said kind of blew past your head, totally fine. We'll hit it. We'll hit on it later. Um, okay, more on the intuition. Nikhil is going to take over for the next two slides um, to talk about why machine learning is important. Yeah, so let's go a bit more in detail on an example of like how machine learning models compare to our thinking process. So when you guys were little, I guess we all thought about, didn't know what animals were, didn't know what a cat or a dog was, and we were all like not sure which one was which, right? And so how did you guys figure out which picture is a cat and which picture is a dog? Because they all have, they both have paws, they both have um, ears, both have like nose, a lot of common features. So. I want you guys type in chat. How do you guys like what features features do you guys look for in distinguishing a cat and a dog? And yeah. And how like I guess how do you get to those? How did you get to those um features when you were learning about that in the first place? And I guess features can be anything from like color to like different tails. Yep. Pupils, yeah, definitely can be used. Yeah, there's a lot of different features you can use. Um, Cause face, face, head and shape. Yeah, whiskers, yeah, only cats got those. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different features that separate the two. And by looking at a lot of pictures of cats and dogs, you were able to figure out the difference. So I don't know if you guys had this when you guys were growing up. When I was growing up, I got one of these picture books with a bunch of animals in them, like a cat, dog, giraffe. And like your parents would walk you through it. And then they would be like, this is a cat. And then you wouldn't know what it, if it was a cat or not. And then later on, they show you a different picture of a cat and be like, what is this animal? And at first, you might not know because you, you haven't seen many cats before. You might be like, oh, it has fur. It has a tail. And you're not, you're not looking, at the, looking at the actual tail itself, but you're saying it has a tail. 
and it has two eyes. So maybe it's a dog, but it's actually a cat. And so from that experience, you might learn, oh, I see whiskers on that cat, on that animal. It's probably a cat. And so from that experience, you've learned now, after your parents told you that's your cat, you've learned that, oh, cats have whiskers, dogs don't. Maybe it's considered this factor in determining which one's a cat and which one's a dog. And so over time, over repetition, with a lot of different practice data to learn on, a lot of different pictures, you learned what, what was a cat and what was a dog and all, a lot of other animals. And so that's how we learn. But for a model, it's a bit different, but it has a lot of the same ideas behind it. Uh, let's me next slide. All right, cool. So this is a problem that's actually pretty recent, actually, um, of class, um, finding objects in images. And so in 2012, so only nine, eight, nine years ago, um, the first model um, recognizing a bunch of images called AlexNet was created. And so as you guys can see in that picture, it's able to, the, uh, based on an like, image, tell what the thing in the image is. So you can see like it terminated, it found um, in this picture in the bottom right corner, it found a Madagascar cat, which is incorrect, but it's a model. It finds leopards and motor scooters. Basically, let's talk about how to actually learn these type of things. So at first it's a model like us. So like when we first learned, didn't know what a cat and a dog were, we were thinking, we didn't know how to determine, determine which animal is a cat or a dog. We were basically making like kind of poorly informed decisions. We were just looking at maybe colors or something like that. And so in the same way, this model didn't really have that much basis to go off of before. So it, it seems like this, this ship before and it's seeing like, oh, is it a ship or is it like an arrowhead? It has like the same shape as an arrowhead maybe. So it's like, it can't really tell a difference, right? And so to fix that problem, the people made, who made this algorithm gave it a bunch of images, a bunch of images. And with those images, they, gave, they told the, the computer what that image was. So I gave them, it gave it an image of a, a car and said, this is a, a car. And I gave it an image of, a, of, a, of like a Oreo. They said, this is an Oreo. And millions of images later, the computer learned like to associate certain features, like how we associated like whiskers with cats to certain pictures. So for example, it might see like this mite in the top left corner. It might be like, oh, it ha it's red and it has like really like spider-like legs and it has like a certain number of them. And so that, that might be how it determines it's a mite. And so after seeing so many different pictures and from those pictures determining uh, which features are more important to look at, um, this model is able to slowly and but surely learn which features to focus on to determine which, uh, which picture is which and therefore be able to learn how to recognize a picture, uh, an object in a picture. And so after a lot of learning, we can later put, give, this, give this model random pictures on the internet, like maybe like a picture of someone's face. And it'll be like, you know, take that picture and given what it's learned in the past of training data, it can now determine, oh, that's a human face because it has two eyes and a nose. And like, maybe they're like in this certain configuration where like that nose is like in between the eyes, but a bit lower. And so, things like that they'll be picking up on and that's how they'll figure out uh, what's what. And so in a similar way to how people learn, um, computers are also learning by getting a lot of data and in improving their decisions based on that. So, yeah. And that was a lot to go off of, but if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask other questions about that. Um, when you're like, working with like these huge piles of data, who does the work of like tagging the image to like what it actually is? Uh, so for a long, for actually even now, a lot of it is actually people tagging images. So um, people get paid to tag image, like label, label images is typically how it's called. Um, like Amazon has its, has its own like site basically where you can like a bunch of your data on a website and basically tell us and someone else like on the other side can be like um i want to i'll label data for you in exchange for like this much money and so mostly right now it's a lot a lot of human stuff maybe in the future we can have our own models to label things even so gotcha okay if you're curious about what the amazon thing is it's called amazon mechanical turk you can look it up and even get a job doing it if you want <laughs> Quick disclaimer though, it doesn't pay that much for per image. So you have to, you have to, you have to label a lot of images to get a, like a certain amount of money. 
Oh yeah, John also uh, gave a great example uh, where if you've done the captures that like yeah. the capture that Google does, uh, where you mark all the pictures of cars or traffic lights, that's labeling data for Google's teams. Okay, sorry about that. My computer froze as well in the middle for some reason. Um, but that was all the slide portion of the presentation we had for you today. Um, we'll now have an intro to Python section. So if any of you guys are unfamiliar with Python or want a quick refresher um, or are new to programming, please stay for this portion. But if that's something that you're really familiar with, feel free to drop out and join us again next week where we'll be talking about um, K-nearest neighbors, which is another ML algorithm. Before we get started with that, actually, I'm gonna launch another poll. Ben, could you launch the poll actually? Okay, there we go. This poll is also completely anonymous. Again, we just wanna see where all the members are at and how familiar you are with Python. Sorry, are you guys gonna have like Python courses after like every meeting or is it just this week? It'll just be this week. If we don't get to it this week, we'll continue on next week. But um, beginner track should be something you should be able to comfortably follow along with even if you're not totally comfortable with Python just yet because a lot of our workshops do focus on theory. But um, I'd recommend that if you're unfamiliar with Python, um, hopefully today's workshop will be like a good introduction and maybe you can spend some time learning on your own. So by the time we get to our mini projects at the end of the quarter, you'll be comfortable enough to work with us. And for the people that are completely new to Python, it's, it's a really easy programming language to learn, especially if you've learned a different language in the past. So um, don't be intimidated by the idea of learning a new language at all. You should be, you should be in good shape if you attend today's workshop and just spend a little time on your own. Um, also, Ben, really quick, could you make me host? I can't see poll results. Oh, you're not host. Um, no, because I got kicked out and had to join again. Oh, I see. Okay. I can do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Also, um, yeah, I'm going to read the question out loud for anyone watching the recording. Someone asks, will we be talking about specific modules for projects to set up or Python in general. So what we're gonna do in a few minutes is just talk about Python in general, but we have a workshop dedicated to NumPy and Pandas or some tools that we're gonna be using for the guided project. Um, yeah, so if you're curious. So th those are the specific libraries or modules. If you're not familiar with that, then don't worry. We have a whole workshop on that. And what we're about to do right now is just a little bit of introduction. All right, give me one second to open up the Colab notebook and we'll get started. In the meantime, does anyone have any questions on any of the content we covered so far? Again, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, great. That's awesome. Also, everyone who wants to follow along, they, does everyone have the uh, Python notebook or Colab notebook open? You can see in chat if you're having trouble. Yeah. Thank you also. Also, in chat if you guys haven't already opened it, but that should be the link to the Google Colabs, which is where we'll be all like show, um, doing our Python demo. Mm -hmm.
Ooh, this is taking a while to load. Ben, could you try sharing screen? Yep. Let me have, let me get it open since I also restarted. Okay. Oh, um, I'm no longer host. You're gonna have to um, add me again. Thanks. All right. I think this should work. Okay, can everybody see this window? Yeah, I actually, I have a quick question uh, real quick before we start of, um, do you know where we can find the, the ACM membership form? Oh, right. Um, so the membership portal, since I have this window open, sorry, let me move around the Google. Yes. Okay. So I believe it's um, ACM, oh, there it is. So members, uclaacm.com slash login. Let me send this in the chat. This is where you can find the portal or uh, make an account. Awesome, thank you. Yes. Oops. There you go. Yeah, so if anyone else is curious, this is where this is where you can put in the membership uh, portal code uh, that in the, in the first slide of the workshop, and you'll get a certain number of points that you can redeem for prizes, I think, at the end. And you can also like keep track of your progress, yeah, you know, going through workshops, not just through ACM AI, but all the other ACM committees, they do workshops as well. Right, so, um, Move forward. A link to the slides. Yes, that's important. So you guys can follow along. Let me see if I can find that again. Yep. Um, okay. So we're just going to introduce the basics of Python. Um, first off. Like for the, I, I saw in the poll that I think a couple of you don't have any prior pro programming experience. So hopefully this will be useful for you. For those of you who do have some prior programming experience with, but not in Python, I think that's a, a like a, a several of you. Um, this should be pretty easy to follow. And for those of you who do have experience in Python, this might be a little slow, but hopefully you can bear with us or um, follow uh, uh, next week. But first off, um, with Python, what we're going to do, we're only going to use, okay, actually, where should I start? Um, in Python or with any programming language, what we want to do is we have, we're going to give the computer a set of instructions to execute. And those set of instructions are going to execute. And in, in um, specifically the environment we're going to be working in is, is Google Colab. Um, and you can just do this, you can use this in your browser. Um, you don't have to download anything. I believe if you're if you opened up the link to this notebook, it might not let you edit it. So what you're going to have to do is first go to file and um, like save a copy in your own drive, and it should open in a new window or a new tab that you can't edit. But in Google Colab, each of these blocks are going to either be text like this, so you can add a new text block, and this is just for whatever you want. You can add like documentation. You can even add images in here. So that's sort of like Google Docs in a way. And, but what's different about Google Colab is that you can also um, add in these code blocks. So like I said, in Python, we're gonna be writing sets of instructions and each line is like its own instruction or statement. In this case, what we're doing is, what you can do is uh, you can add a new code block. In this case, we've already added a code block, but let's say we're here we can add a new code block and then we can do addition. We can have one instruction where we're just adding two different numbers together. And what we do is on the left here, um, there's a little like play symbol. If you click that, it'll run the cell 
Yeah, it's not authored by Google, but it's authored by us, so you can trust us. And it's going to execute it and give you the result of the last line in this code block. In this case, there's only one line in this code block, one instruction. So it's going to execute this instruction, eight plus two, and output the result, 10. So you can do addition, just like you do in any kind of math. Um, and then you can also do multiplication. But since um, we're typing on our keyboard with QWERTY, we don't have like the cross symbol to multiply. So we're using the asterisk as multiplication. So if we run this code block, uh, you notice that we have two lines. This first line is a comment. So all comments start with a this ha a pound symbol. Um, and what comments are, if you're not familiar with programming, is that they're basically lines that don't get executed. It's just if you want to add a comment or some, um, some note that you know, what does this line actually do? In this case, we're writing that this, multi this, is, this multiplies three times two. And then it doesn't, even though it's embedded in our code, it doesn't execute it. Again, it only outputs the last line. And in this case, the last line is three times two. So the output is six. We can also do a subtraction in the same way and you'll get the expected output, negative four. Modulo, some of you may or may not have seen this before. What it is basically is just the remainder operator. So it's basically five divided by three and you get the remainder of that. So if you divide five by three, the remainder is two. So that's the output two. If you do something like 10, then if you do 10 divided by three, um, you will get a remainder of one. So our, expect out, our expected output is one. The same thing for division. Again, we don't have the division operator on our keyboard. So what we use instead is the back or forward slash. Uh, in this case, five divided by six. In Python, if you're familiar with a language like um, C or C++ where, you, you, where all the types are explicit and it's strict, um, in Python, it's, it's very, um, it's, I think, it, I forget the technical terms, but it's, you don't really have to worry about types. It will implicitly convert. It will sometimes implicitly convert between types. Sometimes you have to explicitly convert. But in this case, we're having, we have two integers and when we divide it, we get what we expect, the fraction output, which is 8.333. Um, we can also do integer division. So this is more familiar for people coming from C or C++. If you don't come from C or C++, then you don't have to worry about it. But if we do integer division, basically what, it, what, it, what it's doing is it's kind of truncating that value to the nearest um, integer. So in this case, if 0 0.8333 truncated to the nearest integer will be zero. Um, it's not rounding, right? Because if you rounded it, it will go up to one, but since we're doing, we're truncating, it goes down to zero. Exponentiation has a special operator, which is two asterisks um, in a row like this. And so two to the power of five will be 32. Um, you might notice that there's no space here, but there are spaces here. Spaces don't really matter too much um, when, you're, when you have an expression like this. So I can add a bunch of spaces and it will still execute the same way. What is important in Python is spaces at the beginning of the line. So if I do this, um, it's going to give you an error saying that it didn't expect this indentation. So just be careful about that. It will be more relevant later when we go into functions and stuff. Um, and then another thing I want to talk about is variables in Python. Um, I'm, everyone has some math background, at least like in algebra. It doesn't work exactly the same way. So you have to get a little bit used to it. You can assign very, so the equal sign here is the assignment operator. Let me make this a little bigger in case some of you are having trouble looking at it because I am. I forgot to ask you guys, are you guys having, is anyone having trouble seeing anything I'm showing here? And is everyone following along so far? If anyone isn't, just please stop me or say something in chat. If you're not like comfortable saying it out loud in chat or you can also uh, like private message me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm glad this refresher help is helping somebody at least. Um, let me see if I can make the view a little bit larger. 
Yeah, there you go. That's better. Um, so we can assign a variable a specific value. So in this case, we're assigning a variable called variable. So unlike math, it, our variables don't have to be single letters or characters. Um, we can actually make them words, but you can't have any spaces. So words, numbers, or like letters, numbers, and underscores are okay. Dashes are not okay because that gets interpreted as subtraction. Um, but underscores are okay. So in this case, we have a variable called two. And you might notice that there's no output, right? Like going, what? I thought you're supposed to output the last line. It's because this last line is, is a statement that's saying we want to assign the value of two to the variable called variable. And if you actually if we hover over, it, it tells us that this is a variable. The type of this variable is an integer, and the value is number is two. But what if instead what we do we add another line called variable? Um, then it will output two because, like I said, when we run a code block by pressing this run symbol, it's going to output the last the the last the value of the last line. And in this case, our last line is just variable and it will output the value of variable. Um, we can also assign variables to other variables. I don't think we've assigned first prime number, so I don't think this is going to work, right? So again, if you made a mistake, it will tell you usually something informative. In this case, it says we have a name error and it says uh, on this line, uh, which is line one, we only have one line, uh, we have an error where first name, first prime number is not defined, meaning that we haven't defined what first prime number is. It doesn't know if this is a variable, a function, or whatever this note is, or whatever this, this word is. So what we have to do is we have to assign it a value, like first prime number. Let's say we assign it um, two. And now when we output it again, there's no output because the last line is assignment, not um, is an assignment operation. So, but then if we output the second prime number, we can see that it's two, which plus one, which is three, which is what we expect. Well, what you might not expect is, let's say we change first prime number afterwards. Let's say we change first prime number and we change it to three. You might expect that, okay, since second prime number is assigned the value of first prime number plus one, it's my output four, right? But it doesn't actually do that. So if we run this again, again, it outputs the last line. It still outputs three. So why is that? The reason is um, Python executes from top to bottom, left to right, most of the time, unless you have parentheses. Um, so the, like if we, if we follow the order of operations, first it executes this first line, which assigns the value or assigns the variable first prime number, the value of two. And then we go to the second line where it assigns this, um, this variable, uh, the value of first prime number plus one. And so what it's gonna do is it's gonna reference, okay, what, did, what is the value of first prime number at this point in time? And in this point in time, the value is two, it's gonna add one to that, and then that sum is going to be assigned to the variable second prime number. And then when we change the value of first prime number, uh, it doesn't it doesn't like propagate to the second prime number, right? It, it, we've already made the assignment. Unless we repeat this statement after this one, it won't go backwards in time and re-execute that to update second prime number. So that's just something that to look out for. Um, one thing that's a little bit, if you've worked with Python or some programming language uh, in the past, it might not be familiar for you when you're working in a Jupyter Notebook format like this one. This is by, also, by the way, this is another term for this environment is a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, Google Colab is just a Jupyter Notebook, but online running on Google servers right here. You can see uh, it's running on Google servers. But if we, one thing that's unique about Jupyter Notebooks is that these variables are preserved across code blocks. So I can reference um, a variable that I instantiated here. So in this case, I can instantiate um, or initialize the value 
or the variable x with a value of three. So now we see that x is a, is a variable that's an integer that stores the value of three. And then we can reference it in the following code block um, and do this, where we do x is equal to x plus one, and then we print out x. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but I also wanna so, show that we don't have to, what, okay, let me move this. We don't even have to run them in order. Like I said earlier, um, if we run a single code block, it runs from left to right, top to bottom. But between code blocks, we can run them in any order. You can notice that each of these code blocks, I'm trying to highlight it, but the, the cursor kind of removes it. But you kind of see next to my cursor, there's a number 13. Um, that means this is the 13th block that I've run so far. And this is 17 because I've run this actually multiple times. So if I run this again, you notice that now uh, it says 20. So this is the 20th block I've run. And then we run this one right before it says, this is the 18th uh, block that I ran. Now, when I run it again, it's going to say that this is the 21st block that I run. And so I can go kind of backwards this way. So I can run, I can, I can initialize something here and then I can go back and then reference it here. Like I can do X or Y is equal to X plus three or plus two, yeah. And then we can view the value of Y. And since we initialized X to be three down here, and then we ran this code block, um, Y becomes, um, it is five. And if you look at this, you can see that this is number 22 and this is number 24 because I clicked this twice. And so we can reference variables across code blocks that way. So now a little bit more about this block. You might notice, again, it's not like algebra that you've seen before um, where you know the equal sign means equality. It means assignment. So it's assigning the value of whatever uh, the expression on the right side to the variable on the left side. So on the left side, it's always gonna be a single variable, right? Like this is gonna be a single variable called x. And on the right side, it's going to be some expression. In this case, it's x plus one. So what's gonna happen here is, um, this is again, an exception to the order of operations, like I said. Instead of running left to right, it's gonna execute everything on the right side. So it's going to resolve this expression first. So it's gonna see, okay, X has the value um, has the has the value three at this point in time, and then we add one to it, and then we assign it to x. So now the value is four. Uh, but if we run this again, you might not expect the value to actually increase to five. That's because um, now that x has been updated, the value of x has been updated. When we run this again, it's going to uh, reference the value of x. In this case, it was going to be four. Well, now it's five because we run it again. But then add one to it and then assign it to x again. So if we run this again, what do you guys think it's going to be? Probably you can guess it. It's going to be six. And we can continue down a little further. Um, is everyone still following along? Or is this going a little slow for some of you? I know it is the very basics, but hopefully it's useful. Um, next up is strings. So strings are um, just like text, sort of like our comments here, but you can assign the, a string to a variable. Again, if you're coming from a language like C or, uh, or C++, um, we didn't. We don't need to tell. We don't need to tell Python what type this variable stores. So this variable can store an integer. It can store a floating point number. Floating point number is a number with like decimals. Um, or in this case, it's storing a string. So if we run this, we we're storing. We assign the value of of uh, the variable string. So you can see it says. Oh, I, you can't see my finger. Oh, there. You can see. There you go. So it says the variable string is storing a, um, a value, a string value um, with, the, with the actual value called hello world. So since we wanna treat hello world 
as a single value, we have to delimit the beginning and end using, in this case, a single quote. In Python, we can also use a double quote here. So if you're coming from C or C++, you might be used to double quotes. Um, you can also use single quotes. You can, they're interchangeable. And what's useful about it being interchangeable is that you can have single quotes uh, inside your string if you delimit it with double quotes like this. So that works. And then you can see that if you highlight this. Come on, work with me. No, nope. okay, there we go. You can see that it, it, in the value of this string has an apostrophe, yeah, can't. Even though we use it earlier here as a delimiter. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So Vaishnavi asked in chat, like if we can get a number between one and five for pacing, if five is being too fast, one is too slow and three is just right. So I'll wait until you guys answer that before I move on case. Three, okay. Too slow. Okay, um, going a little slow. I'll go. I'll speed up a little bit. Um, it sounds like we're we're almost at the right pace. I just don't want to get anybody lost because this is supposed to be like a, a very beginner introduction. Um, we'll be using it a lot more next week. We'll actually be implementing something kind of interesting, um, like a, a an actual machine learning algorithm next week. Um, even with the basics we've learned here, we don't we don't need a lot to implement it. So hopefully it'll be kind of fun next week. But this week it's a little bit of a slog. I know, sorry. Um, all right, I guess we can move on. Ah, yes, thanks. Yeah, this good review. Um, right, let's move on to printing. So. Earlier, I said that you could, um, when you run a code block, it's going to output the last line of a string, uh, last line, the, the very last line. So, like if I did yet another string like this and I run this code block, it's going to output the last line value. And, and the value is can't use single quotes when you already have them in a string like that. Um, but um, there's another way you can output data. And that's using a function called print. So this is the first function that we've seen. Um, if you've view, if you've seen functions before in math, uh, again you might be used to them being a single letter. In this case, we can use words. So in this case, our function is called print. It takes in a single value. It can be any kind of variable, and it will output it to um, our console. In this case, our console is just going to be like this right here. So it pr it prints out. The, num the value that you pass it. And what's different about this versus something like um, just putting it at the last line is that this doesn't have to be the last line. So if I move this up here like this, oh, did I lose it? I think I lost it. My clipboard is empty. Um, if I do print num up here, um, it prints out 17, even though that's not the last line. And again, num, you might think, okay, wait, num isn't initialized yet because it comes afterwards, but because it preserves the values of um, variables between runs of a code block, um, num is still initialized by the time we read this. If we instead, another thing you can do is you can actually restart the runtime. If you've like, if you have like a bunch of variables defined and you know it's, it's getting a little messy, you can, uh, restart the runtime. And what this will do is you might notice all of these code blocks, the numbers have disappeared. And even the one that we're currently on, the number has disappeared, meaning that we haven't run anything yet. So if we run this now, nothing's been executed yet. Um, and then this is the first block that we've executed. Num hasn't been defined yet because it gets defined in this second line. And so we get an error. Does that make sense to you guys? Or did I lose someone there? It might be a little confusing. Hopefully that's that makes sense. If it doesn't, please please let me know or like say something in chat. Um, all right, next one. We can yeah we can print out not only an integer value we can also print out strings. 
you might notice uh, when we output the string up here, it actually has quotes around it because it, it's giving us the, the value. Um, the value of the string doesn't include those quotes. So if we just print out the value like this, you notice it doesn't include those quotes on the outside because those quotes are just to tell Python that in between these quotes is the value that we want to store in the variable. That's not including the quotes. Um, the next one is another way that you can use the print function, or it's, it's actually the same way, um, but we're introducing a new function called format. What format is, is if you, if you take um, an object or a value, a variable, in this case, our, our object is this string. My name is uh, and then curly brace, my, I'm curly brace years old. Then <clears throat> what's happening is, oh wait, let me first, before I forget, run this again. Um, we can add, we can use this format um, function in order to fill in the blanks here. So if we have a string with these curly braces, these curly braces are treated as special characters by this format function. And the format function will basically take in a string like this and then substitute in the values name and number into these spots here. So when we run this, it's going to print out my name is George and I'm 17 years old because um, it just substituted the value of name, which is George right up here, and the value of num, which is 17 into these two curly braces. So the, the, um, the order matters in that case. Yeah. You can also, uh, and that's right, that, that's enough for now. Um, all right, we can move on to lists. So lists are containers for data. Up until this point, we've looked at data in the form of like integers. We can also see data in like fractions like decimals. We also saw data in the form of a string. But now we're going to work with containers of data. So what this is, it's, it's like a collection of, uh, of values. So in this case, we have a list of numbers. So lists are delimited just like the string. Uh, they're delimited with, um, with square brackets. And each value um, is delimited by a comma. So like, kind of like a spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, and then if we check the value of my list by hovering over it, come on, you can see that it's a list with five, uh, five values, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25. You can actually include different kinds of data. So for those of you coming from C or C++ land, this might be you know, weird, um, but you can do this too. You can, add, you can have a list that includes lots of things, um, like a string, uh, a number, and then a number with decimals, floating point number. Um, you can even have nested lists in this case. So this will be useful uh, you know, when we have matrices or you know, multi-dimensional data. But in this case, we just have a list where the first element is a number, one. The second element is actually another list with three elements in it, two, three, and four. The third one is five, and so on and so forth. And this can nest indefinitely. There's no limit to it. Um, you can modify lists like this. So if you have an existing list, in this case, numbers, um, you can append something to it we're using a function called append. So you do numbers, then the dot operator basically says we're operating on the object called numbers. In this case, the object numbers is a list of numbers. And we're appending to that list the value 10. And so if we run this, we notice that it's exactly the same as numbers, but it also has the number 10 appended to it. And if we run this again, um, you might be able to guess what's going to happen because like I said before, it preserves the variable uh, across runs. If we run this again, it's going to duplicate it and append it again. So you have another 10. Run it again and you have a third 10. You can index lists using bracket notation. And what this means is 
what if we want to just get the value, the first value of the list? Indexing, unlike you know, in uh, if you if you have like a vector or a matrix, you might you might be used to indexes starting with uh, one, or if you're using something like MATLAB, you might be used to starting at one. In this case, it starts at zero. So if we say we want the first element of the list numbers, so in this case, the first element is one, we can do numbers and bracket, open, open bracket zero, close bracket, and we get the first value. We want the second value. In this case, the second value is not a number, it's actually another list. Um, we can do one like that, and then we'll get three values. If we have a multi-dimensional uh, list, or in this case, a nested list, uh, we can index again and again and again. So what's gonna happen here is, what we're doing is we start with our, our first number. So we'll, it, it starts off with this one, sorry. Try highlighting it. So the first step is it takes the, um, the third or the fourth element of the numbers list. So it's one, this is the second element, third element, um, and then fourth element. So it's this nested list right here, six, seven, and eight. And then the next one is we're indexing the second value of that list. So that's six, seven, and eight. So this is the second value, seven and eight. And then we're indexing the first value of that uh, nested list, which would be seven right here. And that's how we got seven. Okay. Um, so we're resetting, or we're making a new list here, initializing it with these values. And then this is a little different, If again, if you've not used a language like this, like Python before, um, you can actually index, you, you can slice the list up. So you can get like a subset of the list. Um, so in this case, our list is five elements, five, 10, 15, 20, and 25. What we're doing here is we're starting at, um, the index one, index one, because we started zero, this is index zero, this is index one. And then we're, the colon symbol means that we want everything from this first index up until this last index not inclusive. So we start out with index one, which is 10, index two, three, four, but not inclusive of four. So we only get 10, 15, and 20. That's what we should be getting. And that's exactly what we get. We have a list where we have the values 10, 15, and 20. Um, and then the next one is, this grabs all the elements. Yeah, so you can also omit one of the, um, one, of the num one of the indices. So you have three colon and then blank. You don't, even, you don't even need the space here. You can even you know, make it blank like that. And it's gonna do everything from the zero, one, two, third element and then beyond, so 20 and 25. Um, and you can do it in the reverse as well. So it's gonna take everything everything from the beginning up until the second element not inclusive. So it's gonna be zero, one, two, not inclusive. So it's five and 10, like that. All right. And you can also, in, if you wanna individually modify uh, one of the elements of the list. So again, this is the, uh, the numbers list up here. So this is the current value of numbers. We're going to be modified. If we just want to modify this first element one, we can index it like this and then use the assignment operator to change that value to something different. So in this case, we change that to one. And now you notice that instead of showing one, like the integer one, we have the string called OA, O N E like that. Um, moving on, we're going to go to dictionaries now. Hopefully you guys are still following. Um, we're going to, dictionaries are, um, they're key value pairs. So if you worked in a different language, that's not Python. This is like a map. Um, but in this case, they're called dictionaries. Um, and the, the key and the value, they, you know, it doesn't, well, in this case, it's, yeah, we, you can, they can be any, any, any kind of data, any kind of value you want. In this case, we're using strings, but you can also do integers. You can do floating point numbers, but they're sort of similar to 
lists in that you can index them uh, in, a, in a similar way, but we index them by the, the key here. So they're key value pairs, right? So we're pairing the key apple with the value one, the key banana with the value two, and the key orange with the value three. And so when we index the key banana, we get the value number two like that. And I didn't execute this one. So if I execute that one first um, and then execute this, we get a number two. And you can also, like a list, you can reassign a specific um, entry. In this case, we're reassigning the key apple to the value one as a string. Again, it, it doesn't need to be all the same type. Like it doesn't also all have to be integers. It doesn't all have to be strings. They can be mixed like this. Um, if you want to just get a list of all the keys, you can do, you can run the the function keys um, on the object your, of your dictionary without any parameters. In the parentheses are parameters, um, and you get apple, banana, orange like that. It's a list. Well, it's it's not a list, but yeah, it is, it's kind of like a list. And you can do the same thing with items. Um, so if you want to, this is useful for when you want to iterate through both the, the, the keys and also the values. So this will return a list of uh, tuples, a list of pairs, ordered pairs. So like if, you know, they're, yeah, they're ordered pairs. Um, so it's a list that's denoted by those, these brackets out here. And each value of the list is actually a pair of values called apple and then the value one, the key banana and the value two, the key orange and the value three. And then you can also, if you wanna know how long or how big my list is, you can use a function called len that stands for length and you provide it a collection type like your dictionary um, or in this case, your list, sorry. And you can get the list or you can get the length, but you can also do like uh, my dictionary you can get the length of that as well. And that's three, because there are three entries, three pairs. This works for any kind of collection. And strings can be think of, can be thought of as a collection as well. Because a string like the, um, like let's say we had uh, um, the variable A with the string um, A, B, C, D. And then we do look at the length of that, we notice that it's a length of four. So our string has four characters and you can actually do similar things like you can index the list of A. You can index A as if it was a list. And if you print this out, then um, you can see that it prints out the first letter, which is A, and then it prints out the length, which is four. And now at this point, I've talked a long time, so I might want to hand it over to Vaishnavi to talk about comparison operators. Hopefully I didn't uh, just throw it on you. No, you're good. All right. Um, give me one second to pull up the notebook. Okay. Yeah, and if they have any questions or, um, you know, any, you're curious about anything about Python, it doesn't even have to be about what I've talked about so far, you know, feel free to ask, unmute or talk in the chat. Also just curious, is anyone from a different time zone, not PST? Yeah. Where are you from? I apologize, this is taking a while to load. Also, don't uh, we, we don't have, well, we do have quite a bit left, but um, it won't be too long more, I think. Mm -hmm. So if you're a little tired, it's understandable. And if you're not satisfied with like the way we've explained it or it's a little confusing or something, then you know, there's a lot of great tutorials online. A lot of people start off with Python, so 
lots of learning resources out there. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, let me scroll up to where Ben left off. So in Python um, and in many programming languages, when you want to compare two different um, values, we often use comparison operators. So right here, um, I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with the greater than, less, less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to um, operators. So here um, we have the statement five is greater than six. And operators usually return, oh, one second. Operators return um, true or false values. So since five is greater is not greater than six, we get false. Um, and often it's also represented as zero is one, whereas zero is false and one is true. Here we would get true because five is less than six. Um, in Python or just like in a computer, since we can't write less than or equal to the way we typically would on a notebook, we often write the less than symbol and then equal to right after. Um, and here you guys can guess that this would be true and this would be false. And if I do that, you would get true again. And to check whether or not two different um, values are equal, we use the double equals operator. Here we would get false again because five is not equal to six. Oh. And this operator is the opposite of equals equals where we check whether two values are not equal. So this would indeed be true because the string not is not equal to the string equal. Okay. And then there's also logical operators in Python where we, um, where we combine multiple expressions. So here when we say one is greater than two and three is greater than two, both these expressions have to be true for this entire expression to return true. So um, this statement here is true and then this one isn't, so we would get false here. Or works differently where, as the name suggests, only one of these two statements would have to be true. So um, can we get an answer in the chat on what this would return? Okay, awesome. This would return true indeed. And the reason is because one is not greater than true. So yes, Jeffrey, you're right in that this would be false, but um, three is greater than two. And according to this logical operator, we only need one of these two, two statements to be correct for this to return true. Okay, how about this third one? Oh, no worries, are good. So again, we have the and operator, so both these would have to be true. Awesome, so this would be false. Any questions on what we went over so far? And here again, um, when you're looking at an and statement, you only need to take a look at one of the two statements to see, and if, or we, you need to take a look at both statements, but if you see that one of the statements is wrong, without even looking at this, you already know that this is false. So for some reason, you don't know what this is saying. Um, you don't need to because three isn't less than two and that's enough information to know that this returned false. Okay, let's move on to if, else, if, and else statements. So often when you're programming, you want to write in conditions like if blah, 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 do this, else if blah, 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 do this, and if not any of the conditions listed above, then do this. So um, in the same words that I used earlier, we say, if two is greater than one, print this. Else, print this. So because two is greater than one, this print statement would execute and Python will not even look at, will not take a look at the else statement. We only go into this section of the code if this condition is false. So right now, if I execute this code block, we would get that two is indeed greater than one, or just say, 
Um, yeah, we'll just keep it as that. But if instead I change this to if two is less than one, this condition won't be met anymore. So then we keep on looking through the if else statement and then else means that um, if this condition is not met, then this would execute. So here we'd get that two is less than or equal to one. But we can also change this and say else if two is equal to one, print two is equal to one. And here we see that, oh, my bad. There we go. Here we see that nothing prints, right? Because we didn't put a default else statement saying, if none of these conditions are met, then do this. We just said, if this condition is met, do this. If this condition is met, then do this. But neither of these conditions were met, and we didn't tell Python what to do when neither of them are met. So we can add an if step, if or we can add an else statement here saying, that two is greater than one. Awesome, any questions with if all statements? Oh, I also wanna mention at this point that um, this is where the spacing starts to matter a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit? All right, that's a good point. So um, indentation is really important in Python um, and that comes at a trade-off because there's a lot of syntax that you don't have to use in Python that you do have to use in other programming languages. But because we have that flexibility, we do have to specify um, when certain statements have to be executed within other ones. So if I don't indent over here, we get an error because this statement is sort of nested within the if condition. So when you're using um, if statements or for loops, Make sure that you're indenting in order for this to properly execute. And visually as well, that's just good um, in other programming languages as well, that's just good coding practice to make this easy to interpret for someone who's reading your code. Ben, do you have anything to add? No, that, that's all. That's great. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so um, let's take another look at an if else statement. So we have a variable that we declared here and set it to 100 and said if the number is greater than that, or you guys can read this yourself. Um, can someone tell me what the answer would be or what would print? Feel free to unmute yourself or say something in the chat. Probably print C. Yes. Awesome. It would print C because this is false and this is false. Um, an important thing to pay attention to here, again, are these operators. So this indeed is true, but this isn't. So this condition isn't met. And then here, both these conditions are false, which is why we come here. And notice that the else statement doesn't get executed, right? So at any point, um, only one of these letters is going to be printed. In no case will we get A to print and C to print, or B to print and D to print. Um, so when you're running this code in an if-else code block, you're only going to have one condition being met. If we want print, if we want D to print regardless, we would just get rid of this else statement and then have that come after your if-else statement, and then we get C and D. Any questions about um, if statements? Okay, awesome. Let's move on to for loops. Um, also, just taking note of time, it is 8.46 and the workshop will wrap up at nine. So if we don't get through all of the material today, we still have a bit left. We'll just continue next time. Okay, so um, often when you're programming, you want to do the same thing multiple times. You want to execute the same block of code multiple times. And it's not very efficient to write it in X amount of times, right? So like if, if you want to print hello world three times, instead of saying print hello world, print hello world, print hello world, you could use something called a for loop that prints it the specified number of times for you. And we'll take a look at for loops below. So here earlier, Ben just, um, talked about lists. 
So we just declared a list and um, put these five values in it. And here we have something called an end statement, which is really useful in Python. Um, as And the readability is great too. So as it says five in my list, this statement is checking whether the value five is in your list. And because it is in your list, it returns true. So if I change this to something like 10, we would get false. And we'll see later on that this is really useful when you're writing code and you want to check whether you want to check for a specific value and execute a certain block of code if that um, condition is met. So here again, we would get false because Apple isn't in the specific list. But if we put banana, we would get true. Okay, now let's get into for loops that I was talking about earlier. I want to print out um, every single element in this in this list, and there's two ways I can do that. Um, one right is I could write my list. I could write a print statement for every single value in this list, and it would print out one, and then I'd say um, print my list, and then at the index value of one and then two and then three and four and so on you get the idea but that's very inefficient right if it's 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 much more efficient if we could just tell python to just print out every single element in that list and that's where for loops come into play so um this is the syntax for it we would say for every element in my list we discussed the end statement earlier for every element in my list print out the element and here element is just a variable name. We could just say for every blah in my list, print out blah. And blah is just the name that Python would assign for each element in this list. And it would work just the same. So I, um, we often name these what they are just for readability, but these are again variable names. We could just call this fox and then say for every blah in fox, print blah. And the execution would be the exact same. But ideally, you would be naming your variables in a way that's really easy to interpret. If someone were to see this, they wouldn't exactly know where Fox came from. But again, it would execute, um, it, it would execute fine. Okay, um, there's also other useful functions that you can use that um, perform certain operations for you. So the dot reverse function right here, what it does is it just reverses all the values in your list. So, um, oh, also notice how, notice how even though I changed the name of my list, this executed fine. And that's because, um, wait, did we declare it earlier? Yeah. Okay, yeah, notice how, and this is something Ben was talking about earlier. Even though I renamed this, the my list variable um, is still allocated this list right over here. So here we used a for loop again to print each element in my list. And it prints it in reverse because the dot reverse function reverses all the elements for you. And earlier we mentioned Python libraries. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with what a library is, it's basically a, at a high level, it's just a place where a lot of code is written out for you. Um, and you can use some things written there to make your programming easier. So somewhere, um, Python knows exactly what to do when reversing. It, it seems like magic, but it, there's, there is code written somewhere that explicitly tells Python what to do in order to reverse this list. But because that's pre-written for us, we can just call this function and we'll discuss functions later and it performs that operation for us. Um, can someone tell me what would happen if we execute this block of code? Again, my list contains, oh, let's check the chat. Yes, beautiful, it prints out x four times. Exactly. I'm gonna pause really quick. Does anyone have any questions? Will print automatically lead to a new line? 
Yes. Um, and yes, it does to answer your question. Every print statement is treated as a separate line. So essentially what we're doing in this for loop is this. So um, because each print statement um, gets its own line, it is on a separate line. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. If you remember what this um, operator was, can someone in the chat say what this would execute? For every number in my list, print num, asterisk, asterisk num. Square of each number. Okay, awesome. So if you remember, this is the square operator. So what this um, piece of code is doing is it's printing out the square of each number in my list. So we would get 1, 4, 9, and 16. Oh, sorry, my bad. I forgot we reversed the list. So um, right here, we reversed the list. So we don't get print num squared. OK. It's the exponent. It's the number to its own power. So 4 to the 4 is 256. 3 to 3 is 327. 2 to 2 is 4. Mm -hmm. And 1 to the 1 is 1. Uh, yeah. OK. Moving on. Oh, um, there's something else I wanted to point out from earlier. Notice here that we don't actually use i, right? Like we never say print i, or we never do anything with the value of i. But um, even though we don't, um, all that this is doing is it's going through each each element in this list. But once you're at that element, you're free to execute whatever you want. You don't actually have to call upon the element. Um, yeah. OK, let's keep going forward. Uh, I think you guys get the idea. Let me know if there's any questions. But here, it would print out, oh, we haven't looked at range yet. So now we're, instead of looking at a specific list or a specific variable, if you want to print, let's say you want to print something out x number of times. Um, you can use the range function to do that. Um, it's extremely useful when you're constructing loops because it lets you print something out an X number of times. So here, when you said range for I in range 10, that would include every number starting from zero up to but not including the number here. I think Ben mentioned this earlier, but in Python, ind indexing starts at zero. So um, I would take on every single value starting from zero up till but not including this value right over here. Again, um, here, if you want to specify the index value or the value that i starts off at, you can do that by putting in two arguments for the range function. Um, again, the second one would be up to but not including, but the first one would be including. So you print out three, four, five, six, and seven. Any questions so far? All right, um, I think we're gonna finish off with for loops and then we can start with while loops next time. Okay, um, as a common specifies over here, we can also specify the step size. So if you wanna print out every other value, um, you can specify the step size in your third argument. So here we'd say start at four, um, print out the value that's two after four. So you skip five, print out six, skip seven, print out eight. Um, and again, it's not including your second argument. So you'd only go up to eight. And right now, um, what we're printing out might seem kind of trivial, but let's say you have a list, right? And you want to print out um, every other value in a list. That's when these kind of functionalities become really useful. Or you want to print out every other value. So for here, for range, you would pass in the length of the list, and then you would print out that index value at that list. So let's say 
Here you pass in the length of the list, then you can just say my list, and then you print out i, and i would be the index. So instead of just printing out the number, you'd print out the actual value that that list holds there. I think we'll end the workshop there, and then we'll continue on with for loops or with while loops next time. Oh, I forgot about these parts. Yeah, thanks for sticking around uh, for those of you who have. Um, hopefully, this has been helpful. I'm assuming most of the people who left like already knew Python because there was a lot of people on the poll who said More they did. Yeah, sorry, I cut you off. Um, yeah, yeah, I cut you off, that's all right. One more thing, um, I didn't realize there's another block over here, but you can also print things backwards um, and that's what the negative symbol is for. So what this statement right here says is print the last two, um, print the last two elements of the list. Sorry, my bad. I keep, I, I'm like getting confused because I keep forgetting that we reverse the list, but my list holds the value four, three, two, and one. So, um, which is why we ended up printing four and three for a my list and the brackets colon negative two. Thank you guys for those of you that were sticking through, like Ben said. Um, I know it was a little slow today, especially if you're already familiar with Python. But hopefully, if this was something completely new to you, you were able to learn something new and get a bit more familiar. Yeah, thank yeah, you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you can stop the recording now. Bye. Wait. Yeah. yeah. Cool.